Hey everybody, uh, we're going to be reading chapter 3 in The Magician's Nephew. Um, this one's called uh, The Wood Between the Worlds. The Wood Between the Worlds. Uncle An Andrew and his study vanished instantly. Then, for a moment, everything became muddled. The next thing Diggory knew was that there was a soft green light coming down on him from above and darkness below and he didn't seem to be standing on anything, or sitting, or lying. Nothing appeared to be touching him. I believe I am in water, said Diggory, or underwater? This frightened him for a second, but almost at once he could feel that he was rushing upward, and then his head suddenly came out into the air, and he found himself scrambling ashore, out onto smooth grassy ground at the edge of a pool. As he rose, to his feet, he, he noticed that he was neither dripping nor panting for breath as anyone would expect after being underwater. His clothes were perfectly dry. He was standing by the edge of a small pool, not more than 10 feet from side to side in a wood. The trees grew close together and were so leafy that he could get no glimpse of the sky. All the light was green that came through the leaves, but there must have been a very strong sun overhead for this Green daylight was bright and warm. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. There were no birds, no insects, no animals, no wind. You could almost feel the trees growing. The pool he had just got out of was not the only pool. There were dozens of others, a pool every few, few yards as far as his eyes could reach. You could almost feel the trees drinking up the water with the roots. This wood was very much alive. I'm going to show it to you. right there. All right. Was very mu much alive. When he tried to describe it afterward, Daggery always said it was a rich place, as rich as plum cake. The strangest thing was that, almost before he had looked about him, Diggory had half forgotten how he had come there. At any rate, he was certainly not thinking about Polly, or Uncle Andrew, or even his mother. He was not in the least frightened, or excited, or curious. If anyone would have asked him, where did you come from? He would have probably said, well, I've always been here. And that's what it felt like, as if one had always been in that place and had never been bored, although nothing had ever happened. As he said long afterward, it's not the sort of place where things happen. The trees go on growing. That's all. After Daggery had looked at the wood for a long time, he noticed there was a girl lying on her back at the foot of a tree a few yards away. Her eyes were nearly shut, but not quite, as if she were just between sleeping and waking. She looked at her, so he looked at her for a long time and said not nothing. At last she opened her eyes and lo looked at him for a long time, and she also said nothing. Then she spoke in a dreamy, contented sort of voice. I think I've seen you before, she said. I rather think so too, said Daggery. How long have you been here? Oh, always, said the girl. At least, I don't know, a very long time? So have I, said Daggery. No, you haven't, she said. I've just seen you come up out of that pool. Yes, I suppose I did, said Diggory with a pu puzzle there. I'd forgotten. Then quite for a long time, neither said any more. Look here, said the girl presently. I wonder, did we ever really meet before? I had a sort of idea, a sort of picture in my head, of a boy and a girl like us living somewhere quite different and doing all sorts of things. Perhaps it was only a dream. I've had the same dream, I think, said D Diggory, about a boy and a girl living next door, and something about crawling among rafters, and I remember the girl had a dirty face. Aren't you getting it mi mixed up? In my dream, it was the boy who had had the dirty face. I can't remember the boy's face, said Dig Daggery. Then he added, Hello, what's that? Why, it's a guinea pig, said the girl. And it was a fat guinea pig nosing about in the grass. Right here. Nosing about in the grass. But round the middle of the guinea pig, there was a tape, and tied to the tape was a bright yellow ring. Look, look, cried, cried Dig Diggory, the the, the ring! And look, you've got one on your, your finger, and so have I. 
The girl now sat up, really interested at last. They stared at each at well, what one another, trying to remember. And then exactly the same moment, they both shout out, Mr. Ketterly! And he shouted out, Uncle Andrew! And they knew who they were, and they began to remember the whole story. After a few minutes of hardly ta ta talking, they began to get it straight. Dig D Diggory explained how beastly Uncle An Andrew had been. What do we do now, said P Polly. Take the guinea pig and go home? There's no hurry, said Diggory with a huge yawn. Ooh, I think there is, said Polly. This place is too quiet. It's so, so dreamy. You're almost asleep. If we give... If we once give in to it, we shall lie down and drowse forever and ever. It is very nice here, said Diggory. Yes, it is, said Polly, but we've got to get back. She stood up and began to go cautiously toward the gu guinea pig. And then she changed her mind. Well, we might as well leave the guinea pig, pig she said. It's perfectly happy here. Your uncle will only do something horrid to it if we take it home. I bet he would answered D D D Diggory. Look at the way he's tra treated us. By the way, how do we get home? Uh, go back into the pool, I expect. They came and stood together at the edge, looking down into the smooth water. It was full of the reflection of the green leafy branches that made it look very deep. We haven't any bathing suits, said P Polly. We shan't need them, silly, said, said D Diggory. We're going in with our clo clothes on. Don't you remember it didn't wet us on the way up? Can you swim? A bit? Can you? Well, not much. I don't think we shall need to swim, said Dig Dig Diggory. We want to go down, don't we? Neither of them much liked the idea of jumping into that pool, but neither of them said, said so. They took their hands and said, one, two, three, go, and jumped. There was a great splash, and of course they closed their eyes, but when they opened them again, they found they were still standing hand in hand in that green wood, hardly up to their ankles in water. The pool was apparently only a couple of inches deep. They splashed back onto dry gown, ground. What on earth's gone wrong? Said Polly in a fright, frightened voice, but not quite so frightened as you might, might expect, because it was hard to feel really frightened in that wood. The place is too pe peaceful. Oh, I know, said Dig Diggory. Of course it won't work. We're still wearing our yellow rings. They're for the outward journey, you know? The green woods take, take you home. We must cha change rings. Have you got po pockets? Good. Put your yellow ring on your left. I've got two greens. Here's one for you. They put on their greens and came back to, to the pool. But before they tried another jump, Dig Diggory gave a long, Oh, what's the matter, said Polly. I've just had a really wonderful idea, said Diggory. What are all those other pools? What do you mean? Why, if we can't get back, if we can get back to our own world by jumping into this pool, well, mightn't we get somewhere else by jumping into one of the uh, others? Suppose there was a world at the bottom of every pool. But I thought we were already in your Uncle Andrew's other world, or other place, or whatever it's called, didn't you say? Oh, bother, Uncle An Andrew, interrupted Diggory. I don't believe he knows anything about it. He never had the pluck to come here himself. He only talked about one other world. But I suppose, but suppose there are dozens. Do you mean that this wood might only be one of them? No, I don't believe this is a wood. This wood is a world at all. I think it is just sort of a in-between place. Polly looked puzzled. Don't, don't you see? Said, said D -D Diggory. No, do, do listen. Think of our tunnel un under the slats at home. It isn't a room in any of the houses. It's a way. It isn't really part of any of the houses. But once you're in the tunnel, you can go along it and come out into any of the houses in a row. Might, might not this wood be just the same? The place that you can get into them all. Well, if you can, began Polly, but Diggory went on as if he hadn't heard her. And of course, that explains everything he said. That's why it's so quiet and sleepy here. Nothing ever happens here, like at home. It's in the houses that pee, pee people talk and do do things and have meals. Nothing goes on in the in-between places. Behind the walls and above the ceilings and under the floor and in our own tunnel. But when you come out of the tunnel, you may find yourself in any house. I think we can get out of this place into Jolly Well anywhere. We don't need to just jump back into the same pool we came by, or not just yet. The wood between the worlds, said Polly dreamily. It sounds rather nice. Come on, said Diggory. Which pool shall we try? Look here, said Polly. I'm not going to try any pool till I know we've made sure that we can get back into the old one. 
We're not even sure if it will work yet. Yes, said Digit Diggory, and get caught by Uncle Andrew and have our rings taken away before we've had any fun? No thanks. Couldn't we just go part of the way down into our old pool, said Polly, just to see if it works. And then if it does, we'll change rings and come up again before we're really back in Mr. Kedderly's, Kedderly's study. We can go. Can we go part of the way down? Well, it took time coming up. I suppose it'll take a little time going back. Daggery made rather a fuss about agreeing to this, but he had to in the end, because Polly absolutely refused to do any exploring in new rules until she made sure about getting back to the old, old one. She was quite as brave as he about some da dangers, wasp wasps, for instance, but she was not so interested in finding things out that nobody ever heard before, for Diggory was the sort of person who wants to know everything, and when he grew up, he became the famous Professor Cook Kirk, who comes into other books. After a good deal of our arguing, they agreed to put on their green rings. Green for safety, said Digit Diggory, so you can't help remembering which is which. And hold hands and jump. But as soon as they seemed to be getting back to Uncle Andrew's study or even to their own world, Polly was to shout, change, and they would slip off their green rings and put on their yellows. Dig Diggory wanted to be the one who shouted change, but Polly would not agree. They put on their green rings and took hands and once more shouted, one, two, three, go. This time it worked. It was very hard to tell what it felt like for everything happened so quick, quickly. At first, there were bright lights moving about in a black sky. Diggory always thinks there were stars and even swears that he saw Jupiter quite close, close enough to see its moons. But almost at once, there were rows and rows and roofs of, and chimneys, pots about them, and they could see St. Paul's and knew they were looking at London. But you could see through the walls of all the houses, and you could see Uncle Andrew, very vague and shadowy, but getting clearer and more solid-looking all the time. I lost my place. One second. All the time. And then, um, let's see just as if they were coming into fo fo focus. But before he became quite real, Polly shouted, change, and they did change, and our world faded away like a dream, and the green light above grew stronger and stronger, till their heads came out of the pool, and they scrambled ashore, and there was the wood all about them, and as green and bright and still as ever. The whole thing had taken less than a minute. There, said D D Diggory, that's all right. Now for the adventure. Any pool will do. Come on, let's try that one. Stop, said Polly. Aren't we going to mark this pool? <gasps> they stared at each other and turned quite right, for they realized the dreadful thing that Diggory had just been going to do. For there were any number of pools in that wood, and the pool pools were all alike, and the trees were all alike, so that if they had at once left behind the pool that had led to our own world without making some sort of landmark, the chances would have been a hundred to one ever against their ever finding it again. Diggory's hand was shaking as he opened the penknife, and cut out a long strip of tur turf along the bank of the pool. The soil, which smelled nice, was a rich reddish brown and showed up well against the green. It's a good thing one of us has some scent, said Polly. Well, don't keep on gassing about it, said De Diggory. Come on, I want to see what's in one of the other pools. And Polly gave him a pretty sharp answer and said something nastier in, in, in reply. The quarrel lasted for several minutes, but it would be dull to write it down. Let us skip on to the moment. <clears throat> at which they stood with beating hearts and rather scared faces on the edge of the unknown pool with their yellow rings rings on and hands held and once more said, One, two, three, go! Splash! Once again, it hadn't worked. This pool, too, had appeared to be only a puddle. Instead of reaching a new world, they only got their feet wet and splashed their legs for a second time that, that, that morning. If it was morning, it seemed to be always the same time in the wood between the worlds. Blast and botheration, exclaimed Digit Diggory. What's wrong now? We've put on our yellow rings all right. He said yellow for the outward journey. Now the truth was that Uncle Andrew, who knew nothing about the wood between the worlds, had quite a wrong idea about the rings. The yellow rings weren't outward rings, and the green ones weren't homeward rings, at least not in the way he, he thought. The stuff in the yellow rings had the power of drawing you in to the wood. It was the stuff that wanted to go back to its own place, the in-between place. But the stuff in the green ring, rings was stuff trying to get out of its own place. So the green ring would take you out of the wood into a new world. And Andrew, you see, 
was wor working with things he did not really understand. Uncle Andrew was like most magi magi magicians are. Of course, Stuttery did not realize the truth quite clearly either, or at least not until late, late later. But when they had talked about it all over, they decided to try the green rings on the new, new pool, just to see what happened. I'm game if you are, said Polly. But she really says said this because in her heart of heart, she now felt sure that neither kind of ring was going to work at all in the new, new pool, so there was nothing worse to be afraid of than another splash. I'm not quite sure that Diggory had not the same feeling. At any rate, they both put on their green rings and had come back to the edge of the water and had shaken and had taken hands again, and they were certainly a good deal more cheerful and less solemn than they had been the first time. One, two, three, go, said Diggory, and they jumped. All right, so that is the end of chapter three. Chapter four will be the bell and the hammer. The questions for today is, why did they mention Professor Kirk? Who was Professor Kirk? That's a tricky one. You may not know. Um, what happened in Between the Worlds? What is the wood between the worlds? What does it feel like there? Why would it be dangerous to stay in the wood between the worlds? And lastly, where do you think the two are going now that they've jumped into a pool? What kind of place? Imagine it. All right, I look forward to reading chapter four, The Bell and the Hammer, with you the next time.